Let's talk now about one remaining intersection of our cube that we haven't talked about really yet, and that is us. So we are also part of this game, integral part, human skills, abilities which are tested in many regards, our culture, the way we do things. And we are in between the technology that we then use in order to modernize different aspects of society. Now, some things after this long lecture, uh, you probably also got a little worried and rightfully so, even so, I cannot get tired of repeating, it's not the fault of technology, it's more like how we use it. So taking an intervention, positive feedback, one positive feedback would just to turn it off, extinguish, put, put water into the fire, right? Really turn it off. And that's one solution. So delete Facebook, right? Don't use this digital technology anymore. Now, that's, that's actually very difficult because the digital is, is all pervasive by now. So you could, well, actually, you could probably go into the mountains or into the desert, never anymore have any contact with money because that's all digitally intermediated, at least in the back office. Never anymore have a cell phone, any contact, uh, mediated contact with any other friends. And, and you will, will, will probably survive for quite some time if you're good enough, you know, getting your own food up there in the mountains or in the desert, all the more power to you, and you'll be disconnected from all of this digital technology craze that's going on. But at the same time, under no circumstance, can you possibly argue that you're co-evolving with the rest of our society, right? This society at a bird's eye view on the level of society is already intricately merged with this digital technology in way too many ways. 80% of the decisions on the stock market are done by artificial intelligence. Almost all our electricity grid is distributed by artificial intelligence. This information processor cannot take decisions that are fast enough to distribute electricity, right? Money, how money is managed in general, is mediated. Uh, even 50% of the marriages in, in the United States start by an artificial intelligence algorithm suggesting on an online dating app that actually I think you two guys should meet, right? And then they end up getting married and probably having children. So where does that, well, AI told them to. So uh, on the level of society, you don't need a chip in the brain. On the level of society, we already intricately merged with this technology. But let's entertain the thought, theoretically, what would happen if you turn off uh, maybe just some aspect of it. Let's just turn off Facebook. And people have actually studied that. So if you turn off Facebook, what then basically happens? So they, they asked people to, to turn off Facebook for four weeks. And that was before uh, a congressional election in the United States, a recent congressional election in the United States. And what happened after people turned off Facebook for four weeks is, one, their knowledge in politics diminished. They were less knowledgeable about politics, also slightly about what is fake news and what is not fake news. They were less informed. Well, social media, especially Facebook, has become a major and for many people the major source of news. So turning off Facebook for four weeks really got people less politically informed. At the same time, it increased political engagement. People who turned off Facebook, they went more to vote they clicked more on political uh, emails, on politics emails. So they got more politically engaged by themselves, less informed, but more engaged. That good or bad, it's, it's, it's interesting to begin with. One, one interesting thing that also happened is they became less polarized. So polarization uh, is a result of this micro-targeting of these filter bubbles. So I know your previous beliefs, I only show you what you previously believed, and I show the other person what the other person previously believed, because I know, according to the confirmation bias, that this is getting your attention. Now imagine there are two groups, a group of mothers who lost their child in a car accident, and a group of young people who really love fast cars. And I only show themselves in their filter bubbles uh, content that reconfirms like fast cars are really cool. No, fast cars are really dangerous. What do you think will happen after a while? Well, the two, they don't understand each other anymore. 
in this filter bubble, they think like, well, that's how reality is. And in that filter bubble, they think how reality is. And it's very polarized. And polarization increased a lot, also due to social media. So it has, it has always existed, this confirmation bias. Of course, that has existed. This psychological bias has existed way before there were digital networks. And we always have the tendency to gather information according to that. But as a recent study from Facebook itself showed, is that digital algorithms basically almost doubled it, almost doubled uh, the level of bias that actually increases. So it's kind of like it's always been bad, but that could be that it tips us over the top, right, with, with digital filter bubbles and micro-targeting. Now, turning off Facebook for four weeks then, expectedly, once you know these studies, it had the effect that it decreased issue polarization. So the left and the right were less polarized because they were less bombarded with these specific micro-targeted uh, filter bubbles. They were less locked in in these micro-targeted filter bubbles. The interesting thing is only four weeks of not using Facebook decreased polarization almost half as much as it has increased between the 20 years of 1996 and 2016. That's a lot. So polarization, as I said, has increased. It always existed. The left and the right always lived in their little bubbles. Digital social media world has accelerated that almost, according to a study by Facebook, almost doubled it. Uh, and now, just turning off Facebook for four weeks, reduced that almost by half back. So. That is actually a big and amazing impact. I couldn't, it was hard for me to believe at the beginning, but this study is really solid and they did, did a great methodology, a very solid methodology in order to show that. Another thing that happened after four weeks of not having Facebook is that your well-being significantly increased, especially in happiness and life satisfaction. So you're much happier, much more satisfied with your life and much less depressed and less anxious. So in these four areas, it increased a lot. Your overall subjective well-being index increased a whole bunch together. And that as the increase of only not using Facebook for four weeks had almost the same effect, 20, uh, almost 25 to 40 percent the effect as the standard effect of, the sta of a standard psycho, uh, psychological therapy. So you can either start psychological therapy or turn off Facebook for four weeks and you will have up to 40% of the same effect on your psychological well-being. Interestingly enough, it also had the same effect as 30,000 uh, additional income, $30,000 of additional income. We know that happiness and well-being goes up with income. It is a, it's, a, it's a decreasing curve, so eventually it doesn't go up so much anymore. But at least it has an effect of like $10,000 more, uh, more income on your well-being, on your happiness, on your life satisfaction. So you can either work harder and earn an additional third, ten to $30,000 or turn off Facebook for only four weeks. So that uh, interesting study, and there have been some other studies along the same lines that actually show that. So that would be, well, negative feedback, just turn it all off. Now, the argument to go to this extreme of turning off digital technology, which I say, again, from a bird's eye view of society, is extremely difficult, but you can turn off one or the other uh, apps, maybe. Um, that argument that this is necessary is basically because some people are saying, you know, these, these, uh, our brains are no match for our technology. So next time you just wanted to check this one Facebook uh, post that just came, popped up on your phone or you want to just watch this one YouTube video that somebody sent you or this one TikTok video that somebody sent you and suddenly you're drawn into a black hole of spending the, 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 the consecutive 45 minutes on TikTok. And so what happened here? What, you got dragged into, well, what happened here is a supercomputer was pointed at your brain. Your little brain almost like it didn't have a chance, right? What can your little brain do? This supercomputer knew you. It knew exactly what you would like. The YouTube video, the TikTok video, the post, the news that you wanted to hear, and, and you got drawn into it. And your brain was no match for this supercomputer. So some people then say, well, you basically have to turn it off because you are not in charge anymore. These supercomputers are in charge. And it reminds me a lot, there's actually, there's actually a legal term for that. It's called volitional uh, impairment. And that's used in court cases. And the definition of volitional impairment is that it's impulsive behavior resulting from impairment 
affecting the ability to choose to engage in behavior or to inhibit such behavior that is not consistent with the self-interest of the individual. So that's kind of like the legal definition. Like you are not in charge. And people with volitional impairment, in court cases, that's often used as an excuse. Well, they behave not according to moral standards, but, you know, they, have volition they, they didn't have a choice. Like, their brain doesn't, you know. So last time you were sucked into a YouTube black hole, into a TikTok black hole, or a Facebook or whatever black hole, like, was it really in your self-interest? to spend another two hours watching some, some online content? No, you were sucked into it. So this is actually, it's kind of like a volitional impairment, right? This technology is so powerful. So that's why some advocates say, well, the best thing you can do is basically turn it off. Now, here the middle ground is as well, as I said, on the societal level, it's extremely difficult to turn it off. And we should develop new technology. We already talked about some of new technology that we could develop in order to make that better. But we can also look, instead of like saying, well, they should invent something new, look at ourselves. How can we become, as humans, get back in charge? So we're talking here about the layer about human skills. Let's go and put the responsibility off to the creators of technology. And we can. So can we get back in charge, Retur re return the power of our will to us? Can you stop watching social media content when it's posted to you? Well, that's the question. And that is the question that we have to remember that these technologies are basically what they are, is they are extensions of our mind. That's what we're talking about here. So, so they're extensions of our mind. Same as your thoughts, your emotions, your paleolithic emotions that come out. They're extended. And these supercomputers, they know you with the content. And they're extending your thoughts. Now, can you stop your thoughts? Let's try. Stop. Take a breath. Observe. and proceed. What were you thinking about there right now? Doing this, stop. What were the emotions you were feeling? Let's check in again, let's check in on the emotions. Stop, take a breath, observe, proceed. What are the emotions you're just having? Maybe a little anxious? Maybe this lecture made you a little anxious? Maybe it made you excited? So, first of all, we have to check in to our own content of consciousness. All right, so the content of consciousness are thoughts and emotions. That's how psychologists define consciousness. And what's in this content, look guys, very honestly, if we are not able to control our own thoughts and emotions. How in the world are we going to control these algorithms? There's, they're, they're extensions of your thoughts, of your emotions, of your reasoning. You're reasoning with these algorithms nowadays. The political opinion that is created in you, how much of that reasoning came together with the digital networks you're in contact with? How much how you feel about an issue? came together with the digital networks you're in content with. So you're reasoning, you're feeling together with this social network. And you're not only recipient. You know, you're also, you're a vector in the diffusion of other emotions and reasoning and arguments at the same time. Just like you, it's kind of like a virus, right? Just like you are endangered and you're a potential vector to spread a virus. That's also how it is with any ideas in these, in these digital networks. They tie us together. So we are all in that together. And that brings me to a very famous quote of Viktor Frankl, a survivor uh, of the Holocaust. And they say this quote is from him. Some others, I, I hope it's from him. Some, some people question that. For me as a German, it's very important since, since he survived the Holocaust. And he wrote a very famous book, Man in the Search of Meaning. And he says, look, look guys, between stimulus and response, there is a space. And that space is our power to choose our response. And our response lies our growth and our freedom. So you do have a choice to not watch the next YouTube video, but that has to be trained. It's kind of like a muscle. You have to develop your consciousness, be conscious about it. 
It starts being aware of the content of your mind yourself, about your emotions, know thyself, right? That's, that's what it goes back to because then these technologies, we can say like, oh, they're manipulating us, they're making us addictive, they're making us anxious. So who is in charge? These technologies are extensions of our mind and going back to some ancient traditions and know thyself, right, uh, in, order to prov pro uh, in order to avoid systems failure. So as I said, as long as we are not in charge and don't know ourselves, our own emotions and our own thoughts ourselves, it will be extremely difficult for us to get a handle on these ex mind extensions, literal mind extensions that we are dealing with here, right? So that will also have an effect on basically on the development of the mental development of future generations. Obviously, we have to be kind of like more detached from all kind of information processes. Be it there's a kind of non-attachment, be it biological information processes, thoughts or emotions, feelings. These are information processes, thinking fast, thinking slow. And artificial information processes. There's a level of non-attachment. The level of consciousness has to be strong enough in order to hold them. And between the stimulus and the response, you know, we have to be able to choose. You have to choose, well what thoughts you want to really think through, what emotions you want to go with, like who is in charge here. And so that has to do with that layer. And it's then not necessarily, actually it's impossible to turn off the digital technology. The genie is out of the bottle. So the positive feedback idea of turning it off is kind of like, you know, in the limbo here, it's very difficult to turn it off and go back. And it's also not productive because technology also has a lot of good, a lot of benefit, benefits to it. But the negative feedback of trying to control it and hold it in the middle, that's what we're actually going for. And that's on all of us as we are part of the problem and of the solution.